solid. Number 612. He keeps me singing. He keeps me singing. And we'll sing the first, third, and fifth. First, third, and fifth. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight and, of course, thanking you for the joy that you give us, that you keep our hearts singing. No matter whether we climb mountains in our spiritual life or go through the valleys, we know that wherever we go, you're with us every step of the way. And if we'll just lean upon you, trust in you, wait upon you, we know that ultimately all things will be well. Bless this service tonight. Help us as we pray. Help us as we look into thy word. Help us to be encouraged and strengthened for the journey. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll be thinking of a song maybe you would like for us to sing and of some prayer requests that would you'd like for us to pray for tonight. Uh, again, reminding some of those on Sunday. Pray for Jennifer Evans. She did get home from the hospital and uh, was kidney stone and she is better and uh, the other issues that maybe they talked about they're not too worried about but she will have doctor's appointments in the days ahead so we want to be praying for her and jake and uh, as they uh, go through these this journey together as well and then don habish and uh, his recovery from his first surgery and then another surgery that he'll have coming up and i'm not exactly sure when that is does the seventh, so it's after the fourth. Okay, the seventh. That would be Thursday or Friday, five, six, seven. That'd be Friday uh, of the next week. So we want to be praying for him. So let's pray for them. Father, we pray for these in our congregation, those that are members and those that are extended family members, and for their spiritual needs or physical needs as they have surgeries dealing with cancer and maybe other issues. We thank you, Lord, for already the answered prayer that. We have seen in Jennifer's life, pray that you continue to strengthen her. And then, Lord, I know there are other needs, and just pray that you'll meet those needs. Uh, help those that are uh, growing older, and help them as uh, we do grow older, and we have uh, physical issues. We pray for Mary tonight, and some of her neck pain, and things that are going on there. We pray for Michael, Lord, in his back pain and shoulder pain, and pray, Lord, that you'll give him some relief. And we submit all these things to you, the great physician, the all-wise knowing God, knowing what we need and knowing how to give us respite from the trials 
and to strengthen us along the way. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, men that came today to work on the air conditioning. We pray, Lord, you'll continue to give them strength and understanding and pray that this will come together and be restored for our auditorium use as well. And we thank you so much for the cooler weather that you've given us, especially on weekends. And we see that as a distinct gift from thee, and we praise you for that. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, anyone have a song or a prayer request? Uh, something you'd like for us to pray for or something you'd like for us to sing? 601. 601. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. Sing the first and the third. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a or praise, a song, a testimony, something God's doing in your life, uh, stretching you maybe a little bit, uh, anything that you'd like to mention tonight. Anyone? Uh, 662? 662. Boy, that's getting right toward the end, I think. 662. said you want to pick another one? <laughs> 663. I don't know if I know that one either. Oh yeah. shadows walking Jesus walking all the way walking in the sunlight walking in the shadows walking with Jesus alone try that again walking in the sunlight walking in the shadows walking every day walking all the way walking in the sunlight, walking in the shadows, walking with Jesus alone. Right, we might have to work on that on Sunday too. Okay, uh, you said 609? 609. Maybe we can sing until we get going here. 609.
Adoptus if we sit like that. So. I'm glad it's eternal security. So he might send us to training school for that, that for sure. Yes, 575. Five seventy five. <coughs> be strong in the Lord and be. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with me as he goes Right. A couple of prayer requests from our missionaries. Uh, we had a letter today uh, from the, let's see, you got to get my site here, from Bolivia, Bob and Terry Sturgeon. And uh, they've, you know, pastor actually several churches he's overseeing in the valley, the big valley. And they have a truck and a bus that they go around and pick up people. And then sometimes they bring them all to the main church. And he said they've just finished their spring and uh, are ready now for the summer. And so he said that they uh, will have a kind of a little bit of a reduced load. But then they're coming home on furlough in late August for three months. And so pray for their journey home from Bolivia. And then I think they're going to be with us in the month of October. So we want to pray for Bob and Terry Sturgeon. And then we also had a note from... Marnie Kraus, she's in Cameroon, and uh, she's going to be taking a furlough this fall as well, as she's got some transitioning going on in her work uh, with one of the lady missionaries she worked with is going to Germany now because of her health, and so Marnie's going to be looking for maybe some different arrangements and housing, so we need to pray for her for that. And uh, then also, uh, the lady... Cindy, Cynthia McGuire in Papua New Guinea uh, sent a letter and I put it on the bulletin board. She sent some pictures of her work and they've been having some good success with people as well. Babies being born and then, of course, uh, some trusting Christ, I believe. And then Amy Potter. How many of you remember Amy, the little girl that played the, the violin and went to the Philippines as a music teacher and also a Bible teacher for girls? And ladies, and she says they're in their summer period as well. And so she's helping with Vacation Bible School. And she sent a letter and also a picture of her 
showing a child on the street uh, Bible story. And so be praying for Amy Potter and her work there with the Bob Jones College in the Philippines. So a number of these lady missionaries and their work are pressing on the upward way. And then, as was mentioned Sunday, we could pray for the rights in Uganda with the instability there and the terrorism and stuff that goes on. And then all of these missionaries, a number of them are in, in areas where there's difficulties, and we want to be praying for them. So who would pray for our missionaries? Very quickly. Someone? Brother Darrell, do it. <coughs> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and uh, we lift up our missionaries, Lord, who are our extension from our church to the world that we cannot reach without their help. And we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, be in their lives. We thank the Sturgeons, Lord, as they have, uh, have many works there that they're dealing with along with the Institute and uh, Bible College. Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, just bless them, bless their work. We pray that as they come home for a, a three-month furlough that you'll give them safety and travel. And, Lord, you'd help them to, uh, um, to be able to report to their churches. And if they need more support, Lord, that you'd supply that. You'd take care of them. We also want to uh, pray for Marnie Krause, Lord, as she uh, makes a transition. And uh, not quite sure yet what her transition is going to be but lord we do pray that you would give her guidance and lord uh, she would be very clear exactly what you want her to do as far as uh, as ministry is is concerned and, and you'd bless her as she comes home also for a furlough in the fall we also pray for uh, cynthia mcguire lord and uh, the um uh, there in Papua, Papua New Guinea, Lord, that you'd help her to uh, continue to do a good work. She does a great work, Lord, and and uh, she takes time to witness to every one of these ladies that comes in uh, uh, for their babies and injuries and whatever, Lord, and, and what a blessing that is. And Lord, thank you for the salvations that they have seen. Thank you for keeping her safe, Lord, through the different times of uh, of killings because of a death and uh, pray that you continue to do that lord and, and just be with them we also pray for amy potter lord there in the philippines you'd help her lord as uh, she uh, teaches music lord um, and, uh, and to the students there we pray lord that you would bless her as they move into the summer season now and, and help her to have a little bit of respite lord and enjoy the summer and uh, and uh, Thank you for her ministry, Lord, and what she does there. We also want to pray for the rights there in Uganda. And, Lord, uh, with the ISIS moving in now into Uganda from Congo, we pray, God, that you would uh, just put your hedge of a protection around them, Lord. Uh, help that radio uh, keep sounding out the good word, the good news to the whole uh, region around there into the Congo and and. Uh, uh, around Uganda and the whole area, Lord, we pray that souls will be saved and you would be glorified. We appreciate what you're doing there, and thank you so much for these people, Lord, that uh, are so willing to go to these different countries to to meet the needs of the of the people there. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Someone else have a song or a prayer request or a praise? Uh, anything anybody wants to share tonight? Song do you have? 326. And we'll get to you in a minute, Emma. 326. I wanted to say, too, Michael and I were at the nursing home today. And I think we had our highest number we've had in quite some time. There were about 11 people out. And um, more are coming. I think it's because of the consistency now every week. And uh, some new people, a couple of new people out were out today. And uh, Mike did an excellent job preaching the gospel and how to live for the Lord. And we had some good songs. And so uh, we thank the Lord for, for that opportunity to minister. And what page was that again? 326. 326. Okay. 326. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's sing the first and third. 
Emma 502 502 stand up for Jesus now can you sing this setting down I think so the meaning is to live for the Lord so stand up for Jesus and sing the first and the third time to be holy. And let's sing the first and the third.
Okay, all right, take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, and then we'll look again into this chapter as we had started last week, and I want to continue on this week, and then we'll look at it a little bit, close out chapter 4 uh, next, next week. We will try to have prayer meeting next week, even though it's the 4th is on Tuesday, but the 5th is on Wednesday, so I think we'll just plan on prayer meeting and if you're able to come, come. If you can't come, you won't be any different than some of the others that can't come. And so we praise the Lord for those that are able to come. And we'll meet and sing and pray and look into thy word and try to finish chapter 4 next week. But you remember, uh, I hope you remember a little bit of what I taught out of the first six verses of chapter 4. Uh, last week I, I put three of those points on your outline for tonight. I don't know if I call it an outline or just some points, but we learned last week out of verses one through one and two that we endure suffering by arming ourselves with a Christ-like attitude. That's in verse one and two. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. It's the idea of putting on armor Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. That's our attitude. For he hath suffered in sin. For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So you remember that one of the, one of the earmarks of the life of Christ is that he always sought to do the will of the Father. He told his disciples that. He said, I always do those things that please the Father. And so if we arm ourselves with a like mind, our primary goal day by day would be to do the will of God, which is to think like Christ thinks and seek to do God's will in whatever capacity that finds us in. It may be in serving. It may be in praying. It may be in witnessing. It may be in emptying someone's bedpan. Who knows what it may be? But we do it with a Christ-like spirit, having a humble and meek spirit to arm ourselves with a Christ-like attitude. So that's one way we can endure suffering. Number two, we endure suffering knowing former friends and associates will oppose us. And that's in verses 3 and 4. He says, For the time past of our life may suffice us, to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banqueting, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. In other words, because of your Christ's life, because of becoming a believer, and for some of us, it hasn't been recent, so may, maybe most of our friends and acquaintances now are believers, but for the new believer and the new Christian, they get saved, they start going to church, they start reading their Bible, their habits begin to change, and then their former friends and associates many times will drop them. Or if they don't drop them, they seek to drag them back into the old way of life. Yet greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And so we're able to withstand that. All believers should be able to withstand that. But we have to be prepared for that. We have to understand that former friends and associates will oppose us. Now, I don't think in, in our culture so much yet, we have a lot of people that set out to oppose us, but more subtle in the nature. But sometimes in your family, Sometimes maybe in some friends, people at work, they will oppose you because you don't go along with what they do. Maybe you used to do that, and they can't compute why you no longer have a desire to do those things. They're like, what happened to you? And you're like, well, I trusted Christ. I got saved. I have a new desire, a new interest. And then sometimes they take that as a personal affront. I know that sometimes parents will be offended because their child will choose to follow Christ. And maybe they choose to follow Christ uh, out of a nominal belief system. They might have gone to a particular church, could have been a Baptist church or a 
Catholic church or a Methodist church, and then a child truly gets saved and wants to serve the Lord, and the parents are like, wait a minute, we taught you, we took you to church, isn't that good enough? Well, obviously it wasn't. And even us as Bible-believing churchmen, we should always rejoice when someone who even has attended here later says, you know, I got saved at such and such a church, or I got saved outside and I'm serving the Lord. Well, praise the Lord they got saved. We would rather them be saved and living for the Lord than continuing on in a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. It's awfully easy to go along with status quo. So sometimes it's good to be, get to be saved, but we have to know that suffering will come <coughs> sometimes from our former friends and associates who oppose us. Then number three, we endure suffering, understanding evildoers will be judged. That's in verses five and six. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. In other words, God's justice and God's way of doing things will see that every person, good or bad, gets their due justice. And if anyone treats you badly, former associates or former friends treat you badly, you don't have to take offense at that. You don't have to take up arms about that. God will see to it that justice is remedied in his time. And sometimes it happens in this life. Sometimes it'll happen in the next life. But we don't have to fight our battles for us. Remember, Jesus said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. In other words, we don't need to worry about the evildoers, and we don't need to fix them and straighten them out Unless God, of course, gives us opportunity to share the gospel, preach, or if they come seeking for instruction, then that's a different matter. But don't live your life trying to straighten out the world. You'll be frustrated, to say the least. And don't live your life being offended over the past. If something happens, good, praise the Lord. If something happens bad, something that's disappointing, then uh, as uh, my philosophy is, Get up the next day and go back to work. Just go on. Don't worry about it. God will take care of it. And there's always a little pain, a little heartache. But enduring suffering, understanding evildoers will be judged by God himself. And he's the best judge. And then number four for tonight and then following, endure suffering knowing it is temporary. And that's in uh, verse 7, uh, A, the first part of verse 7 but the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Now, depending upon your circumstance, and of course, uh, biblically, um, exegetically, in other words, interpret it correctly, we know that when Peter was writing this, the early church had entered into the last days. And the last days began when Christ ascended up into heaven and then will end when Christ returns. That will end up the last days. So that's a long time. No one knew at that time it would be almost 2,000 years, even if he came today, or now over 2,000 years. 400 years ago, if you read some of the writings of the Puritans and Thomas Watson and some of the British theologians and different men and women that, that studied and wrote things, they all expected Jesus to come any day. They're like, the Lord is coming. Some of the great sermons during the Civil War period because of the anguish of the Civil War was that the Lord is coming. In fact, there's the song, The Battle Hymn of the Republic, uh, written by Julia Ward Howe, whose father, Lyman Beecher, was one of the great American preachers. Um, she wrote that with the idea that God's judgment is trampling out the vintage, that the war was God's judgment, and Jesus is coming. And, uh, you know, Christ is coming across the sea. And so, you know, that attitude has always been a part of the theology of the church of Jesus Christ. But even if it's another thousand years, which I don't see how it could be, we do know that in our own life, 
70 years, 80 years, 90 years is a short duration in comparison to time, isn't it? Or eternity. And even if we suffered 70 years, it's still temporary, isn't it? It's going to end. And uh, it might end with our earthly death in relation to people being truly persecuted for the faith, being martyred for the faith. Their persecutions did end. Sometimes it ended at the stake being burned. Other times it ended being thrown into the river with cement blocks tied to their ankles. Other times it ended with them being beaten and whipped, but it ended. So all suffering is temporary. But you know when you're going through suffering, it seems really difficult and hard. It's like having a toothache in the middle of the night, isn't it? Morning can't come fast enough. Because I don't know, there's something about pain at nighttime that just drives me batty. I'm like, oh my, if it could just, daylight would just come. And because I guess we get up and we move around and we feel better about it. But enduring suffering, understand, uh, understanding, knowing that it is temporary. And I put some other verses for you there as well. The end is near. I like what one fellow wrote. He says, no one knows the day or the hour our time will be up. So arm yourselves with a Christ-like attitude and live in God's presence. So as Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Either way, we win. We can live for the Lord. Number five Endure suffering with watchfulness while praying always. And that's 1 Peter 4, 7b primarily. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now when he uses the word sober, he's not talking about abstaining from alcohol, even though you should abstain from alcohol. He's not saying, you know, don't be drinking even though that's not a good thing to do. But he's saying, be serious-minded. In other words, life is not a playground. Life is a battlefield. Life is also a workstation, isn't it? Everything can't be fun and games all the time. You know, sometimes we would tell children, and I probably had people tell me even as an adult, be serious. Be serious. Now, I probably air on the side of being too serious, I have been told, whereas some might err on the side of being too frivolous. But whatever the need, the weakness of each one of us, the Bible is saying that we need to have watchfulness and pray always. The times and conditions of the latter days demand watchfulness. The word, and I can't really pronounce it, son son from no nesate. It means to be on guard, be of a sound mind, clear-headed. And then the other word in that verse means to be self-controlled. So to be watching. In other words, it's like a mili- it's kind of a military concept. When you have a soldier that is getting ready for battle or on the battlefield, you don't want them sitting in the foxhole playing cards. It's not they need to be watchful. In fact, this, that's a good way to get killed, is you might get sniped by someone if you're <coughs> playing, if everything is fun and games. So, in other words, be on guard, be of a sound mind, clear-headed. How many times have we had to say to a child or to a grandchild, you're not thinking real clear today. You know, and in today's world with the media overload and the disinformation, sometimes it takes a little work to think clearly. You know, what is the real situation? What do I really need to look out for? And there's so much, you know, misinformation given. And the best way we can get our information is from the Lord and let God filter it through our minds and maybe put in your brain, don't believe everything you hear. And uh, another saying I was taught is, things are not always as they appear to be. Uh, Give it time. Sometimes it takes time for things to come out 
and to be correct and to be right. So uh, demand, the latter days demands watchfulness. And then we also must pray, he said, and pray, verse 7, watch unto prayer. We must pray with a clear head and an alert mind. Oswald Chambers, in one of his uh, devotionals, you know, my utmost for his highest, he, he says, and I don't remember which one, I've, I've read his over the years many times, but in one of his devotionals uh, for a daily devotion, he says a lot of us in our prayer life spend a lot of time mental wool gathering. You know, if you've had a sweater that the little balls are on the sweater and you start picking it off or you've got uh, lint on your shirt and, you know, you might be, let's say you're at, um, at a lathe where you're working and then there's some, you know, let's say some lint on your shirt. You might stop to pull the lint off your shirt and if you're not careful, cut your finger off on the lathe, right? So be alert. We are living in a world where prayer is business, serious business. You know, I, I think one of our faults as churchmen and church women is we think we always have to be doing something, you know, active as far as going out, doing and uh, maybe a program, and but prayer is doing something. I mean, if you read the Bible, uh, Daniel spent a lot of time in prayer. In fact, this one time, wasn't it like three weeks he prayed? He prayed for, I mean, I'm sure he got up to go eat and wash his face, but he prayed for three weeks, and after three weeks, the angel of the Lord finally got there. And Daniel was, and this is Brantham's vernacular here, uh, Daniel said, where have you been? And he said, well, the, the prince of Persia, which was a demon spirit, a fallen angel, hindered me. And I think he said he had to call for help, probably called for Michael the archangel. And so then Gabriel, the angel, the messenger angel, finally got to Daniel and tell him the things that are in the latter book of Daniel, that the end times are coming and that God's people will be restored. Can you imagine being praying for three weeks. Now again, I don't think that he knelt at the pew or the bench for three weeks. I think it meant he was constantly in a state of prayer uh, in his heart, in his mind. I think that's what the Bible means when it says praying always with all prayer and supplication. Always be in an attitude of prayer. And you can do that while driving down the road. I'm sure sometimes people look at you and if you're praying, you know, just praying out loud in the car, they're the, that guy's talking to himself. Now with cell phones, people are talking all the time. I saw a lady today with her, the only person in her car with a mask, and she had her phone, and uh, she was busy. And so I just thought it was kind of cute. I don't know why someone by themselves in their car wears a mask, but maybe, maybe the smoke that's in the air is what she was doing. But that's not neither here nor there. So <coughs> prayer... Well, let me go back and say this. Prayer in times of suffering requires the best of us. In persecution, it should be clear, it should be reasonable, communication with God which will sustain us. You know, the old timers used to say, I'm praying until I pray through. They talked about praying through, getting through to God. And it's not like God was doing this. The problem is with us, right? The Bible says that God said, uh, my, ear is not, uh, my hand is not shortened that it cannot save. My ear is not deaf that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, willful wrong has separated us. So we have to do a lot of business, don't we? Uh, rather than mental wool gathering, you know, asking, you know, uh, thinking about other stuff. And that takes effort. That takes concentration uh, when we pray. We see that sometimes in our prayer meetings is that it's easy for our minds to wander and, uh, when someone else is even praying. So endure suffering with watchfulness while praying always. Then number six, endure suffering prioritizing Christian service. That's verses 8 and 9. And look what he says. This is fascinating. 
and above all things have fervent charity, the King James says, but it's the word agape, have fervent love among yourselves. Remember Paul said to the Corinthians, love is the chief thing, isn't it? He said, though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Though I understand all mysteries and interpret dreams, if I have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Though I give my body to be burned and offer, in other words, martyrdom, and I have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Because love is the greatest thing. And then he goes on in that 1 Corinthians 13 to describe what real biblical love is. It's courteous, it's kind, it's patient, thinks no evil, seeks not its own. There's a, Basically, if you look at that, a lot of that is just common courtesy. It's just treating others as you'd like to be treated yourself. But he's, Paul, Peter here picks up on that, and he says in verse 8, And above all things, have fervent love among you. Now, it's interesting that word fervent means unrestrained. The idea there is of an athlete who is running a race, and you've probably seen this on television, or maybe you experienced it when you were younger if you played athletics or ran races. You know, when you run, your muscles are stretched. And then as you press on, you know, to win sometimes, those muscles get stretched. You see the athletes get cramps, especially soccer players and those that football players that are really sweating and running hard and stretching every fiber of their muscle to be, you know, great, to win. This is the word he used, fervent love, stretching love. You know, as the idea of it stretched to the point that it's taunt. But you really, it's like, and that's, you know, in athletics, you have a torn hamstring or a pulled hamstring. What happens, it gets taunt, and part of it goes, Doop, I can't go anymore. But God tells us in our love to stretch it. Now, let me ask you this, your participation. Why does our love have to be stretched? Right, he is, he's complete love and has no problem with it. But I agree with you, but I'm looking at something a little bit different. Jimmy? Maybe it's like a muscle. When you use your muscles, you get strong. Well, it's true. The more you love and the more you practice loving God's people, uh, the easier it becomes. But what makes love so difficult sometimes? Huh? People are difficult. Well, sometimes we are just unloving, aren't we? And, and the Bible says, love that person. You're like, I don't want to love that person. They're not lovable. I mean, all of us love little babies, right? The cute little babies when they're quiet. But what if they pitch a fit? You know, I'm the first one to give it back to the mother. Here, you love this baby, you know. Uh, or toddlers. Or rowdy church members. Or delinquent church members, you know, and they're saying, love me, love me, love me, and you're like, I don't want to love you. So you have to stretch your love out of bounds. It has to get, you know, and, and it gets better by practice, but there's still challenges with that. He says, so first of all, we prioritize Christian service by loving one another, and, um, you know, and then... Uh, there's another thought I had on that. Make every effort, and Christian love should be exercised with the thought of the other person's need, not our own. In difficult situations, a lot of us, and I'm guilty as it, of it as well, is, what about me? What about me? You know? Don't I get something out of this? Rather than saying, what about that person? How can I 
minister to that person? How can I serve that person? How can I help that person? Rather than saying, what am I getting out of this? See, love is, t is tough, isn't it? It's tough in the home, it's tough in the church, and it's definitely tough in the world where it's hard to love. Notice also he says in this verse, verse 8, for love shall cover a multitude of sins. Let me back up one phrase too. Fervent charity, have fervent charity among yourselves, for love shall cover a multitude of sins. Now, what does that mean, to cover a multitude of sins? Now, we know Christ's atonement covers our sin, and that is the epitome of genuine love. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the epitome of Christian love. But how does our loving people, how can we cover their sin in a practical way through love? Anyone have any ideas? I struggle with this sometimes. Kind. Quickly forgiving. Not holding it against them. Again, like we mentioned earlier, vengeance is mine, is the Lord. Just let God deal with it. You know, another way is don't gossip about it. You know, if, if I'm going to cover someone's sin that I've seen fall short of God's standard, and that's what sin isn't, isn't it? Missing the mark. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all of us do that at times, sometimes, lots of times. But if someone covers our sin because of love, they don't bring it up. Now, the sin is still there. We'll still need to be confessed. That sin is still between that person and God or whomever they sin against, but we just cover it, you know. We don't go around babbling about everyone's sin. You know, we, we shouldn't. We can't. One, I wouldn't want everyone going around babbling about me. I hope you got better things to talk about. And so you just leave it with the Lord. So have fervent love among yourselves. That's prioritizing Christian service. What is our goal in Christian service? To win people to Christ, to draw people closer to Christ, to educate them in the things of Christ, to demonstrate for them the way of Christ, to live the Christ life before them. That's going to take some stretching love to do that. And uh, I know I need that. Then the second thing he says in this verse, he says... Um, Verse 9, use hospitality one to another without grudging. So the second way we can uh, prioritize Christian service is being good stewards, uh, being diligent in using our spiritual gifts. Um, well, let me go back. I'm going to jump ahead a minute. One of the highest needs in times of persecution is the use of and need for hospitality. Now, especially needed in that day people were cast out of their homes a lot of the jewish believers were sent out of rome sent out of other major cities because of persecution they come to a new city and they need someone to open up their home or to have hospitality hospitality just like refugees do today is they need some help they need someone to open up their heart in their home and those are weighty matters but as we as christians we definitely should do that to the body of Christ for those that are in need and have these things. Uh, being friendly to strangers is what really the word hospitality means. And he says, do it without discrimination, which one to another. In other words, we say, well, one to another. I say, well, I'll do this one, but I won't do this one. I'll do this one. I won't do that one. One to another is a reciprocal kind of relationship. And then he says, do it with a good attitude, not grudgingly or without complaining. All of us have been probably on both sides of that equation. Have you ever had someone say to you, you say, you know, I need, a, I need a ride. And they're like, I guess I can give you a ride. And if you're independent and proud like me, you're like, you're thinking, I'd rather walk than have you do it grudgingly, you know. Or maybe someone has come to us and said, could you help me with this? And you're like, 
You know, body language can say a lot. They just sag. And right away, you know, they don't want to do this. But, you know, I guess I, I guess I can. And so, again, if someone is in need and they ask for help or, you know, being kind to strangers, do it cheerfully. That's what Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 when he talks about grace giving. Not grudgingly. You know, the plate comes by and they're raising an offering to help a missionary or you know, to help some brother or sister in Christ, and we're like, I suppose. You know, if they just work hard, they wouldn't have to, you know. You know, we had to say, praise the Lord. I've got an opportunity to get rid of some of this filthy lucre. <laughs> you know, the Bible does say it's dirty money. And it's not, the, it's not money itself that's bad. It's what? The love of money. But having a generous spirit is what he's talking about here. Use hospitality without grudging. In other words, be kind to strangers. And, of course, in our day, we have hotels. And sometimes, as a church, and maybe we miss the mark here sometimes, instead of taking people into our home and gaining the benefit, and I'm talking about Christian people here, but instead of gaining the benefit of their fellowship and learning about them, we stick them in a hotel which they don't mind, but we miss the joy. Like the missionary, we don't get to know them and know their heart and their mind and how great a person they really are because we stick them over to the motel and then we'll pick them up and you know we just, hi, glad to have you here, bye. So in those days, it was real. They didn't have the corner motel. They had to open up their homes and their hearts and said, you know, come brother, come stay with me. I remember when I was a kid, my dad and my dad was pretty bad about that. My mom didn't particularly like it because they were a bunch of kids and some guy would, one time I remember he brought a guy home that was a young man and he had on it, he was out of the Navy and had a Navy coat and it was cold. For North Carolina, it was cold. And I remember he bringing this guy home and he's sitting in the living room and dad's like to my mom, Ella, we need to get him a pillow and some blankets to let him sleep on the sofa tonight. She's like, I can just see her roll her eyes. She's like, because she don't, she, we don't know this guy. And you, us little kids are peering out behind the doors, you know, and uh, just check it. And um, I did that to my wife one night. I picked up a lady. It was snowing in Winona. And I was coming up Highway 61. We lived outside of town a couple of miles in a mobile home park. And this lady was walking with a suitcase and it was snowing to beat the band, you know. I mean, it was really snowing. And she had a suitcase. She was walking up North Highway 61. And I'd heard on the radio that it's going to snow 10, 14 inches that night. And I, I stopped, and I had a van, and I said, Lady, this is not a good night to be out. And she says, I'm going to Winnipeg. I, I hate America. And something in Chicago, I found out later, her kids had been taken away. And she looked like she'd had a rough life. And so I said, well, get in the van. I'll take you back to town. I'll buy you a bus ticket to St. Paul. And then I talked to Pastor Lyles. I, I called him and said, I'll send a lady up here. And he was going to have someone meet her the next morning at the bus station, Sunday morning. And, um, and so we went back in town. The bus station it was about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. Guess what? The bus station was closed. And I, in those days, I didn't have enough money to put her in a hotel. Probably would only have been $12, $15. So I carried her home. And she was actually afraid. She's like, where are you taking me? I'm like, it's okay. My wife is at home. I got two little kids, Jeremy and Holly. I think they must have been under like six and four or three, something like that. They were pretty young. So Arlene was already going to bed. She goes about 10 o'clock to bed, whether you're visiting or not. She's like, I'm ready to bed. See y'all. So I'm embarrassing her, but hey, that's good. She grew up on a farm. They had to get to bed early, right? And if you stayed at 10 o'clock, you stay too late. So anyway, so <laughs> I went in the house. I had the lady come and stand in the entryway, and I told Arlene, I said, I got a lady out here. And she's like, you got what? And I said, this lady. And graciously, she got up and fixed her food. And we had coffee and some food at night. 
And then she got Holly to move from one room to, I think, Jeremy's room, put a pallet on the floor. So we gave the lady Holly's little bed. And uh, she went to, I don't know if she slept that night. I don't know if I slept that night. <laughs> but uh, next morning, got up, took her to the bus station. She got on the bus and came to St. Paul. And then Pastor Lyles told me later, he said, he's like, I don't know what happened, but she didn't get off the bus in St. Paul because they went down there, somebody from the church here. So I, to this day, I don't know what happened to the woman. But what am I saying? You know, sometimes, and hey, I got a good illustration out of that, didn't I? You know, stretch my love because I was a little nervous about it, and the lady was nervous about it too. I'm like, I'm not a weirdo. I'm not going to attack you. You know, I'm a pastor of a church. She's like, what's that? You know, what's a pastor of a church? So anyway, where are we? Uh, hospitality. And do it with a good attitude, not grudgingly. And I think the Lord, my wife, always has a good attitude about usually everything but me. She keeps me humble, but she's so nice. If I get into something with somebody, she's like, you should be nicer. Don't worry about it. Anyway. Huh? She's got high expectations. High expectations. Boy, she does. All right. The next one, number seven. Endure suffering as a good steward of God's gifts to us, resting in his confidence we can handle the trials. You know, if God gives us the trials, he must think we can handle them. He'll give us grace to bear it, right? God will not let anything come into our life that is not for our good. Isn't that what we quote on Sundays? Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Why is that happening to me? <laughs> God's like, it's for your good. You didn't learn the last time. We're gonna, <laughs> let's go through this again. And we're like, finally, you know, but, you know, we'd be better off just to go ahead and learn the lesson and be done with it, right? But we are to be good stewards of God's gift. Be diligent in using our spiritual gifts. Look at verse uh, 10. As every man or every person hath received the gift. What is the gift? Here uh, he's not talking about eternal life, though that is a gift. He's talking about the giftedness he's given to us as human beings. We have talents and gifts. But he says, as you receive the gift, even so minister, and that's a word for we get deacon, diakonos, the same one to another. In other words, serve one another. Could I get you something to drink? Or could I um, help you in some way? Could I, you know, serve one another? Uh, have a servant's heart and be willing to serve. Even, it says, serve, it says, serve one another as good stewards <coughs> of the manifold grace of God. The word stewardship used in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, you know, a steward was a house manager. He didn't own anything. He was a servant that worked for the house, but he was an intelligent servant. He was a trusted servant, like Eleazar, remember Abraham's servant that he sent to get Isaac a wife. I don't know if you ever thought about that story, but there was a time in Eleazar's life where Abraham told Sarah, Eleazar is going to be my heir. Well, guess what happened? God said, no, he's not. I'm going to give you a son. Can you, can you imagine if Eleazar had jealousy in his heart? Pfft, rats. Long come a son, and I get nothing. No, you get to manage all of Abraham's wealth. And he made that journey to get Isaac. He carried jewels, and he carried things from the master's treasures. She's like, you know, sir, tell me, why should I go with you? He said, look. <laughs> the clothes, the jewels, and he is a handsome dude. And she said, in fact, she didn't say right away, but her dad said, go, go. And she went. 
And so, but think about that. That's all we are for God is stewards of his stuff. I don't own any of his, this stuff. I had a kid ask me one time, you own all this? No, I'm just the manager, the house manager. And sometimes I mismanage, you know? It's like, what do I do with all this stuff? But I've, ever since it was turned over to me by the church trusting me in 1984 and Pastor Lyles, I've honestly tried to be a good steward because I wanted to be better off when I leave than when I got here. And it wasn't bad when I got here. It was a church, an organized church doing the Lord's work. So as good stewards, faithfully administrating, a steward does not have his own wealth, but is trusted to wisely use the resources which belong to the master of the home with the intent of advancing his wealth while caring for the needs of the family. It's always about the bigger picture, isn't it? It's not about me. It's not even about you individually. It's about the Lord's work and those that have great need. So endure suffering as good stewards of God's gifts to us. Resting in his confidence, we can handle the trials. Um, have you ever tried to give someone a job and they're like, I can't do that? And we're like, yes, you can. But we know there'll be trial and error, isn't it? In fact, as I told the AC guy that today, he had his 15-year-old son here helping him. And I said, oh, you're trying to teach your son the refrigeration business. He goes, yeah, but I'm not sure he's going to get it. And I said, well, the best way to get it is hands-on work, right? If you do the work, unless you're really slow, you can learn it. You know, it doesn't matter if you learn it fast or learn it slow. As long as you learn it, you've learned it. And the Lord's work is the same way. It takes some of us a long time to learn how to deal with situations and with the church and with people. And, uh, and, some, and then sometimes we can just mess it up anyway. But as good stewards, be a good steward of your gifts. And he goes on there to say, verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Have you ever heard someone preach and teach that you knew it was from the Lord? And then you heard others that it's like, there's no authority there? Now, we can't manufacture that, but it comes from understanding this is God's word. It's not my word. This is God speaking through me, not my own ideas or thoughts on this. That's why you study and you dig into it and you see what it's saying. And then you can say, I'll speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister or serve, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise, dominion forever and ever. And that's where I get the thought, is we are stewards of God's gift, with the ability God gives, given by God's grace. We don't do it for our own fame or glory, but for God's glory. And that's number seven. Number eight, endure suffering, rejoicing in the knowledge. Trials are a part of following Christ. Rejoicing in the knowledge, trials are a part of following Christ. Look at verses 12 through 14. This is our last two verses tonight. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Basically saying, don't be surprised. I mean, we know Jesus said that if you follow me, if you take up the cross and follow me, you know, or, well... If you're going to be my disciples, take up your cross and follow me. Cross was an uh, instrument of burden. It was an instrument of suffering, wasn't it? Paul said that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, if they've done this to me, what are they going to do to you? Same thing. So why are we surprised when someone treats us badly? Especially the lost. That's what the only thing they know to do. And so don't be surprised. Be mentally ready. And uh, actually the phrase there for the fiery trial has the idea of the burning of you. And I think Pastor John talked about this a couple of weeks ago. 
when he talked about Nero using Christians to light his gardens in Rome during that persecution. This is about probably, Peter was probably written after that time period, but Nero would dip them in tar and use them to light his gardens. So Peter says, and now probably, and you know what the emperor does, other people will do, other city leaders will do. So probably throughout the empire, Christians were being persecuted to the nth degree. But he said, don't be amazed. It's going to happen. I read today, and I started to print it off, but it didn't have much in it on the internet, on the news. But it was in today's news. Christianity is being persecuted more now in the world than ever before. It's an epidemic, especially in places like China, the Middle East, uh, which is part of Afghanistan, Muslim countries, Africa, Uganda. Uh, Christians are being slaughtered. I mean, children, they'll come in and destroy the whole group. I mean, it's ugly out there. And, and it's getting uglier here, isn't it? And if you think that some people, even in our country, wouldn't kill you if they could get away with it, they would, just because you're a Christian. You know, the anger, and, and, and Satan is stirring up the anger of people. So don't be amazed. Don't be surprised if someone treats you badly. Uh, then he says in the next verse, but rejoice. Now that's kind of an anomaly, isn't it? I'm going to be persecuted, but praise the Lord. He's not talking about a fatalism. He's talking about recognizing that ultimately you've been chosen to share in the sufferings of Christ. You know, we sing that song, when we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. But can you imagine standing among the martyrs? Those that gave their lives? Those that stood at pivotal moments in history and said, I die for Christ rather than surrender my faith. We get to heaven and we get to meet those people. You know, that will be glorious, won't it? And, and they'll say, well, brother, what did you go through? Oh, my coffee was cold. Someone spoke ill of me. Someone didn't like my sermon. And I got burned at the stake, a guy's going to say. I had my head chopped off. I had literally had, some are going to say, I literally had the skin peeled off my body while I was alive. You know, there's a book in the library. Uh, I read it years ago when I stuck it in the church library. It's called um, By Their Blood. And it's a story of people that have been martyred for Christ around the world just in the 20th century. It's not even talking before that. It's not talking about the 21st century. People, missionaries, national Christians, they were slain. Why? Simply because they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and tried to live it. And nobody's going to persecute you if you don't try to live it. If you try to live godly in a perverse world, you will get that. And thank the Lord we still have a certain amount of freedom in our country. So think of those who have suffered. You know, we, we I can finish on this note. I went way long tonight, but sometimes I just get carried away. Um, you know, July 4th, the America's birthday, holiday, Memorial Day, we celebrate. But what do we celebrate? Who are the heroes? The heroes are not the ones that sing, my country tis of thee. It's the ones that fought on the battlefield. It's the ones that went down with the ship. It's the ones that suffered in prisoner of war camps. It's the ones that were wounded and made it back and then had post-traumatic stress syndrome and maybe wandered the streets of America thinking nobody cared. Those are the heroes. Those are the ones we should really celebrate, isn't it? Not, you know, the person with the beer and the brats and the hamburger. and You know, everybody likes a good parade. 
But we have good parades because men and women fought in the wars. And that transfer that over to the Christian life. Our glory will be someday when we get to heaven and, and we'll have the battle scars for the Lord. And hopefully they're not self-inflicted, right? Well, how'd you get that? Well, I cut myself, you know. So I hope, I hope you get the point. So anyway, I think what Peter's trying to tell us in chapter 4 is endure suffering the way Christ endured suffering. I think Hebrews chapter 13 says that. Um, Chapter 12, being compassed about with so... Chapter 11, being compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Then chapter 13, it goes on there to say that we, you know, follow Christ's example. And then I think he even says there in the third verse, but ye have not resisted unto blood. He's like, what does it cost you? And if it hasn't cost you bleeding yet, don't worry about it. You'll get through it. So, anyway... Next week, what we'll do is finish off this chapter. I think I listed at the bottom regard, admonitions regarding behavior while suffering. So he gives some little warnings about don't suffer as a sinner, as a wicked person. If you're going to suffer, make sure you suffer for the Lord. Father, thank you for these truths tonight. Bless these men and women. Continue to bless our church, your church. Help us to grow in grace and knowledge and numbers. And we pray that many will be added to the church in the days ahead as we endeavor to be faithful to the end. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.